Imagine a vibrant discussion between people that includes both openness and critical thought in the pursuit of truth. The Purchasing Truth Podcast is an experience, a journey, an exploration of the impact that negative messages in politics and the media have on our families, community, society, and nation. Join your hosts, Bill Sterling and Tom Hazard, to discover new concepts and language strategies that will reveal effective ways of establishing truth. This podcast series will tackle current events, leadership challenges, healthcare confusion, integrity in business, and many other areas that affect us all. Gain clarity and understanding of the various truth perspectives. Welcome to Purchasing Truth. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Purchasing Truth. I'm Tom with your host, Bill Sterley. And Bill, I was thinking of you last night as the second, well, actually, technically the fourth, but it's just the second set of Democratic debates, this time on CNN, and this was the second night of it. I wanted to be a fly on your wall and see how twisted into a pretzel you must have been, just hurting because of how tragically some of these candidates are unskilled at communicating. I'm sure they're all very bright people. They're all very well intentioned, but they're, they don't have always the best command of, of language and how to communicate what it is that makes them a great leader. So I, you know, obviously you and I were talking about today's episode and I think we want to talk about what it takes to be a great leader or what, you know, some of the qualities of a great leader are. But uh, I can't wait to hear how you felt about some of what you saw in this most recent debate. Well, Tom, thanks again for uh, really framing uh, this uh, topic today. You know, how, truth and the authentic leader, and how does a how does a leader speak? How do you get behind it? You know, how do how their words and phrases make a difference? You know, to the energy of the listener. Um, you know, as somebody that spends time both as you know as a communication specialist trying to give people the right words at the right time and being able to uh support better adult style dialogue um (laughs) you know it's really so important for us to um look at the things that people say and do and realize well that's nice but it really didn't land or gosh, you know, just with a little bit of communication coaching, you know, you might be able to win an election on this and you might be able to raise 10 points, 15 points in the polls just by, you know, having your points ready to go and stop being and stop winging it and stop being responsive and stop doing stuff that you've all already done and stop surrounding yourself with people that are just yes people. You know, you've got to surround your people that yourself with people that are going to give you pushback that are going to sharpen, you know, your language and start sharpen the saw a little bit, not sit back and, and just say, Oh yeah, that was really great. I think you did pretty well tonight. <laughs> no, you, no, you didn't. You yeah. didn't do well tonight. You did modest. You, you know, you said a message that's not in alignment with, you know, creating a leadership edge. Okay. So, wow. I can really okay. appreciate that bill. Definitely. You know, and I was struck by, you know, <laughs> Joe Biden, even, I mean, my goodness, the one quote was, everybody's talking about how terrible I am on all these issues. Do you think that's something that he should have said? I mean, that's not how I would. No, it's not the strongest, uh, strongest sentence because you're asking people to investigate how terrible you are. Um, What you want to do when you want to do is like saying, um, you know, approach a approach some an obstacle or a pushback with curiosity and what it happens is is it changes it into a incidental judgment it's like there's been a message going around here that i stood for this i stand for this and my request is you as a voter don't be distracted by that See, I just was a great Joe Biden without being a great Joe Biden. This is the message. And then frame the criticism in the field to time. You know, 
if I think back on my 19, um, my 1985 mind that made that decision the way it did and thinking about the circumstances I was in, it was the best response at that time. As we move through the t uh, period of time and as we go into the future as a nation, yeah, boy, yeah. now you left the past in the past, didn't you? Handle it, handle it and stick it where it belongs because the framing of when the thing is is not the framing of my identity. Don't look at the picture, reframe the frame. Yeah. Put it where it belongs. Tom, have you ever redecorated your house? Oh, yes. Good. And you know when you're doing that, you're going like, here's some things I want to keep. Here's some ones. It's like, yeah, this has kind of been on the wall for four years. You know, I may want to change this thing, you know, or seven years or something like that. It's not a fit now. It's a, Somehow it was really nice when I put it up back there and it was really delightful for a time period. But right now it's not really good, a, good, a good fit, you know. And, yeah. and clearly, Tom, you and I are not dressed in our 1970s, 80s, 90s clothing. We're, we're just not. We're and just I don't have that 1970s bowl haircut anymore. And I... <laughs> <laughs> and, and back then I had a full head of hair, but that's a whole nother thing. And it was long down to my shoulders. Just say, it, you know, <laughs> I, I, I can resemble that remark, but for me, it was the late eighties. Yes. There you go. So, so the, so the fun part about this is that we want to do a better job of talking about what leadership is. And if you're going to be a type of leader, step into the type of leader you are. And so let's talk about the four types of leaders and what the politicians are not doing to claim their space. Claim your space as a leader and stick in there and, and make it work. So the ones that are doing the best jobs of this are three of the four front runners. Three. Okay. The ones that are doing the best job of this. Um, uh, uh, Bernie Sanders is staying inside his identity and he's staying inside his messaging. The last person that's done that this well is Ronald Reagan stayed inside his messaging. Really? You can literally take the first speech that Ronald Reagan delivered as going to become the governor of California and look at the first or, or one of the uh, one of the speeches as he got uh, you know elected you know the way he did that speech there and they're uh, almost identical it's like literally the same well bernie really did own who he was That's he right. didn't apologize for anything when he was attacked on um on uh you know uh, qualities of a bill that he wrote and he actually other people are trying to characterize you know what he did did or what was in the bill and he says i know what was in the bill i wrote the bill or something to that effect right 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 and, i'm standing uh, he didn't apologize at all no no it's like listen i know what's in the bill and i i hear that you're trying to pick on it but you know that's not what's in the bill fully you know i i kind of wrote the thing the way i wrote it because i write bills you know <laughs> and and you haven't write a bill and i guess you could pick on that but quite frankly you write a bill you write a bill you stand out there and take the shot now <laughs> Do you see how I could get as animated as Bernie gets is because I'm channeling the, it's called the internal advocacy. And we'll talk about that advocacy piece in a second when we talk about the primary qualities of a leader. But let me just frame for everybody the four uh, um, uh, kind of meta types of leaders. So let's take a look at um, somebody that um, in our history uh, like Colin Powell as a leader. Okay, he's okay. a military guy, um, very, very sequential, rule follower, follows orders, safety oriented, you know, very strong structured person. And Colin Powell as a leader as, is going to stand in a place. The female side of Colin Powell would be like Martha Stewart. Okay. Those are very similar leaders. You know, one is obviously Martha Stewart with how to uh, put the decorations around your Thanksgiving table and how to do all the details that go into that. That's a part of her leadership, and it's very much a part of his leadership. Opposite of that is like Richard Branson. I have multiple companies. I am bringing leaderships in several different verticals and several different industries. And I am giving very 
uh, small messages of engagement to those leaders to run the mission that I'm, that my brand Virgin has that is standing for because that's what Virgin Airline did, that's what Virgin Mobile's doing, that's what Virgin Records did, that's what, you know, you see, you can go down the list and uh, Virgin Galactica, oh my gosh, it's a space program for God's sake. You know, right. he's going to stick, he's going to take people up and, you know, hey, listen, I put an airline together, I might as well throw, shoot people into space if they want to go. How much money is that and how safe can I get it? You know, <laughs> you know, how safe can I get in and how, how can I get comfort and safety to go together instead of, well, putting people in a small little capsule because that's the, that's, that's, that's what I got to do money wise and you know, whatever it costs to do that. Okay. So, um, the, the high end, the, that entrepreneur, that risk taker, you know, out there in that place is very different than the safekeeper. Those are very, very different leaders. And the visionary leader is going to have um, uh, an uh, Elon Musk quality to him. That would be another one that's in that same kind of category. Yeah, yeah, I did this PayPal thing, but now I'm going to do this car thing. Now I'm going to do this transportation thing. Now I'm going to do this space thing. So those are very, very different leadership. I, I, I can't imagine Martha Stewart ever wanting shooting anybody in space or anybody trusting her to do it or Colin Powell the same thing. They're, they're, not, they're not those kinds of visionary kind of people. They're not going to take that risk. They're not in that mindset. They're not even getting near the spaceship. They might watch, but they are not going. But I want that mindset in charge of the safety of the safe cap uh, of the capsule. Okay. Sure. Yeah. All right. So now let's look at the other side, the other two leaders too. The other two leaders, if you think about the strong connector person. So Oprah Winfrey, her job is interviewing people and her leadership is how can I create stories and multiply and amplify stories of these people in their journey and share that stories with others and interview people to get out the stories to engage spirituality in a certain way. Many religious leaders are in the same category as Oprah Winfrey because it's about here's what the connection that is so valuable when you get two people together and really connecting in a really uh, a strong way. Um, Jeff Bezos is really much, very much in, her, in that interpersonal category as a leader. He wants to make it easier for people to get things, you know, and, and so that's really, really also very, very valuable. And then opposite of that is the, the person with the strong uh, financial business um, um, uh, logical analytical mindset you know, somebody like Bloomberg that knows numbers, Some, uh, somebody like um, uh, the this, uh, this, uh, Jack Welsh that really, uh, Lee Iacocca, that drove the bottom line, had a good interpersonal skill, but had a sense of what the numbers would be to make sure that they're hitting the bottom line. And Oprah's not paying attention to the numbers. I mean, but these other guys, these other business financial leaders are very strong in that space and they know the numbers, you know, and, and that's really good. Now let's take a look at those four qualities and then let's set the candidates on the, that same template. Okay. Of, can, can we, can we label those four run down that a little So it's a little, I mean, I understand the people you associated with, but you run down those four okay. types, just one last quickly. Okay, so let's just, okay, so let's start the, um, um, let's just do, let's put, um, so let's say the safe, the planner, the safekeeping person, right? Let's put, or the planner, the detailed person, let's just do it that, or the planner, the detailer versus the visionary okay. person. So this is the Colin Powell, Martha Stewart versus the Richard Branson, Elon Musk type. That's correct, that's okay. correct. That's right, right. So those are two of the four. That's right. And then the the the, um, the interpersonalizer, the connector, is going to be the Oprah Winfrey, and the person that's interested in customer service. You know, a little yeah. Jeff Bezos, which is very different than the bottom line uh, Bloomberg, the analyzer, the uh, logical, rational leader that's interested in the numbers. Got it. Okay? 
All right. Thank you. That's very helpful. So let's do low hanging fruit. The low hanging fruit is, is that if you take a, um, uh, uh, take a look at one of the candidates, Yang, that comes out of the technology world. Right. He's in that logical, analytical, and he said it the other uh, last night of the debate. He goes, "I'm his. I'm the exact opposite. I know how to do math, and Trump doesn't know how to do math." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so he's saying, "I'm a stronger analyzer than the person that I'm running against." I know the math. He doesn't know the math. I know that this, this, um, this living wage, this, this, uh, this incentivized thing, the math works. My math works. Now, is he making the strongest case about his math? No, because people stink at math. And, and that's doesn't – being a good math person, when people have suffered with math, Really, it's like you've got to talk. You got to. If I'm going to get, if I was on Yang's team, I would say you want to make you the most math-friendly pe- person that they would say. I trust him with math. This other guy with math, I don't trust with math because he won't even show me the math uh, that's in his taxes. He can't even show it the math that's in there. If Yang would have went there, it's like, oh I know my. I know math better than Trump knows math because Matt, he doesn't want to show his math on his Texas on his taxes. Oh he, my, that would have been brilliant. It's his, it's his move. It's if it's your power move that just set up the narrative that's opposite of the, I get enthusiastic about this. It's uh, and And the reason why is because people don't know, the the breadth of language, the the breadth of advocacy about what can you speak to to differentiate yourself and saying, <sighs> just- I could oh I'm seeing some opportunities here. He also uh, another way he could have said it was, I know math. The president knows math so poorly that's why he's always under audit. Th- that's right. Then, then the president has nowhere to go. But oh no, I know math. Just because I'm other audit doesn't mean I know math. Oh well, then show your tax returns so we can see your application and, of math. Gosh, you know, if he was really good at math, he would have no problem bringing his taxes out. I guess. You know what? I guess he just isn't as good as math as he would like people to believe. He has his edge now of a sword because he just says I'm is what nights might wear, and then this is the reason why I'm I'm his nightmare. Oh my. Oh my gosh. Okay. Note to the future Democratic candidate for 2020, the eventual nominee who's going to go toe-to-toe with Trump. Please take notes now. Yeah, please take notes now. Seriously. You know, I, I'll tell you what, hashtag, hashtag, Michael, yay, right now. It's like, this is, this is, you know, and, and when you, when you know what your strength is, step into your strength. Okay. Step into it. Brilliant. Yeah. And, Brilliant. And, and pull the and pull the edge. I, I have a suspicion about you know the best leaders and which of these qualities they have i want to sort of save that until a little later in the show and see if i'm right bill i talk to ask you that question later but uh but i think that you're right that regardless of where you fall as a leader you've got to go with your strengths don't you you got to go with your strengths and you also got to know what office you're running for. The office you're running for is very much um, uh, the, the office of the president is supposed to be a CEO mindset. And, and we do not have a CEO mind mind in the office right now. The reason why uh, see why Obama got poked at is because he is, he brought into the office a CEO very safe mindset that had to distribute information and leadership to all four of these strengths. Okay, and that's that's a, a, maybe we can talk about that next time. Is that what is the ideal mindset for a president? You know, okay, is, well, yeah, that's sort of where I was going. Well, but okay, we can okay. save that for a future episode. Okay, we cool. will because we got. I mean, defining it this way. So if I take a look at the visionary folks that are on the stage. And who are our strong visionary people? And the one that sits at the strongest margin of vision is going to be Marianne Williamson. And she's going to get dinged most because of that. All the comedians are very happy to take 
take to take swipes at her and put her into the this is the category of the Dustin. This is what she said in the past. And this is why she wouldn't be because one of the problems that visionaries get into is that it's unbelievable. And you know what? If we didn't have visionaries, we wouldn't have entrepreneurs. I mean, and if just to think about, you know, I mean, Richard Branson being stuck in the, you know, in the, in the Caribbean and then saying, you know, this looks like a business opportunity. I think I'll start an airline. I mean, that's the origin story. It's like, I think I'll start an airline because I happen to get stuck in the islands and I can't get off of here because the airlines to these islands are run so poorly. I mean, that's what he thought. I mean, and he did it. And then every, he's, he's one of the most terrifying people because if he would say the following sentence watch how scary this gets you know what I think I'm gonna do I think I'm gonna start virgin soda I think I'm gonna go in the soda business and he goes into and takes on Pepsi and Coca-Cola and and, and Dr. Pepper they would be terrified because they know somewhere between 15 to 25 percent of the revenue that they're all having he's taking it he's gonna pull it right off and he does that in the mobile industry 15 to 25%, he pulls right off of them. You know, he's going like, holy crap, what happened to my bottom line? He showed up. Why? Because he's optimizing, you know, and he, and he just does that. You know, that's what the entrepreneurial visionary does. So Marianne Williamson is the push. She was the most Googled candidate coming off of the debates. Why? Because she's standing in the visionary place. And it doesn't matter what she is saying or doing. What it matters is her delivery of her small messages and engagement. I would particularly coach her to speak and pick better words and phrases, and that would boost her from here to here. And then she would be in the 10 or 20 or 30, 40% of the votes, you know, of the things, because right now her visionary message is a little bit too high for people to grab a hold of. You know, it's, I, I really love the, the need for love. I want to talk about how love is important. I want to talk about how love is important for each other. Not at the initial debates, I would not. I would talk about mutual respect. Do you see the difference? Right. So she, her best thing is mutual respect would look like. Fairness would look like. Truth regarding the healthcare system would look like. See, now all of a sudden she's got gr uh, greater ground to stand on, and then she can deliver her micro message after that. But she's got a, but her visionary is a little bit too much for the bottom of the rung of the ladder for some people. So it gives the comedians and the news pundits op opportunities to take shots at her. And, and then all of a sudden she's kind of exposed, even though what she's standing for is a very strong value. Who doesn't want to stand for love or loving each other? Isn't that what kind of most religions do? <laughs> Isn't that like Jesus's pri primary message? Just saying, you know, isn't that kind of like a message from Buddha or, you know, didn't, you know, as a part of <laughs> what Mohammed did, it just like is a little wacky, but she's actually talking in that larger visionary standpoint. Why? She said, you know, she has a spiritual quality to her. She has that, you know, that love and caring, but really to get the traction in the political realm. Um, in the leadership realm. So she is going to sit in and this is why she has that a little bit of that Richard Branson and then just l uh, is able to lean towards down the Oprah people to the interpersonal pieces and Oprah loves her. She's a spiritual guidance so and they, they talk on that level, you know, and she, she does, you know, capture, capture that. Now the ones that get are getting beaten up right now are the ones that are more in the, bottom line, the analytical place, or even the safekeeping piece, they're called the moderates. All the moderates are going to get kind of stuck a little bit because the visionary message, the extreme progressive message, as soon as you move it to the moderate, to the center place, what happens is, is that the Republicans are, are, are so in that dominating space here, they've been pulling the narrative into this very scary safekeeping place and scary uh, financial place that it's kind of allowed um, uh, them to 
get more votes, and they have done a really uh, scary, wonderful job of uh, really um, marginalizing the the visionary message. Uh, they marginalize the visionary message because they call it crazy, uh, and they are trying to uh, use the message of socialism and trying to redefine socialism as a scary thing, where actually what happens is socialism, um, the way they're they're <laughs> what they're not doing it, the, the, what the, the the real the real value is. How do you create stability so people can go to sleep uh, that night and wake up the next day and feel some general sense of certainty in their world? Um, stop scaring people. That would be my micro message. But what the problem is is that in politics is that it's moved to scare people. And the, the problem with news media is that if they don't scare people, people won't watch the news. And so that's, um, that's kind of like the tragic circumstance that we're in right now. Okay, so, so, okay, so we've got these different people. Well, Kelsey Gabbard is going to sit more on the, uh, more on the, the, the safekeeping military organized that's that's where she is and she's got you know some great strength over there that i really particularly appreciate um uh uh, uh pete Buttigieg is is has a balance more of a balance of all four than i all see them. that i see that as well i think he has a balance of all four and i kind of wondering if he's kind of the tortoise in the race of the tortoise in the hair right now with all these 20 people you know He's, I think when he speaks, he speaks very well. He stands up for his positions. He's articulate. He has empathy and compassion most of the time, it seems. And he's trying to draw a distinction. He's playing sort of the, the Jack Kennedy card of it's time for a new generation of Americans, right? It's not so bad. It's not so bad. Not and so he bad. does, and he has a, and he has the mindset to sit, uh, sit in there. And um, he is the tortoise in the hare. And there are those people and the other folks are in the race and they are, they don't fully know how to, um, you know, to learn to be known instead of, they're more in the space of doing things. They're more in the doing things rather than he's kind of like in the being place. It's like, hey, I, I, you know, went to you know Afghanistan and went to war. I came back and served. I kind of did it this way and that way. I kind of am standing in my truth about who I am as my identity. I'm not going to like kind of hide from that. I got to be truthful and let's see what the voters do about it. Are they interested in it? You know, I'm sounded better than the other guy. So I'm going to get voted. And who do I need to win the election? I got to need to be better than the other guy, you know, and you know what he's, you know, he's going to be a part of a long lasting political career. He's not going anywhere for the next 25 years. I mean, he's not because he's right. so strong and he's so committed and uh, you know, to you know, standing for the best of acceptance of differences. I mean, he's standing for the best of the acceptance of differences. He's going like I'm standing here. I've got this thing. So boy, and if if that isn't the stark contrast to the present occupant of the White House, I don't know what is. Yeah, and um, what the, the one of the things that President Trump. Uh, uh, Trump does wonderfully in regards to leadership is that he keeps the sizzle uh, and the smell of the sizzling steak in front of the people that are and that and that cultivate the value of loyalty that say I am sticking with this person they might not be perfect but I am sticking with this person because this person, here it comes, and this is going to get upsetting. This person makes me feel like they've heard me. Now, it doesn't mean they're going to do anything. I've just been heard. Right. I'm being understood. He's speaking to my cultivated propaganda belief about myself. Um, he's... He's in this place. Now, whether it's a relative of mine or a relative of yours or a friend of mine or a friend of yours, it's, it's easy to hijack the brain to believe that this person is doing something for them 
But meanwhile, they're actually doing things that are not in my best interest, but they've kind of hijacked the identity of what I used to vote for. But now all of a sudden they're, you know, the front door is open, but the back, I'm sorry, the front door is locked, but the back door is open. So they can steal anything they want out of the house, you know? So, so, wow. okay. All right. So, so the, these different leaders are in different places. Now, Elizabeth Warren in her leadership has a very, very interesting blend of things that puts her as a, fo a forerunner. She actually has the numbers on her side. She actually knows how to do math and she also knows how to do plans. Yeah. So yeah, that's her big thing. It's her mantra is I've got a plan for that, which is, you know, going to get old, but it's true. She does appear to have a plan for just about everything. Uh, but there's got to be more than that. Is, is this sort of oh. social connection piece missing? Oh, you you are making my day right now. I'm so glad you opened that up. That's right. She doesn't have the appeal of Oprah, right? Right. And it's so funny. You, you said it's like really crazy. It's like that plan thing is going to get old. Now I'm going to say this is going to be upsetting. The plan, the discussion of a plan gets old to a visionary. See, Tom, uh, you, you and I, I'm a visionary. Yeah. I know. <laughs> See, I walked you into the bear trap. So, <laughs> so, so you and I actually sit in the visionary place as consultants and as, as people that look to promote and market and help people get their messages out to the world. That's a visionary quality. Now, I'm going to say something upsetting that every politician needs to know. Okay. All right. Government is a very, it's, it's, an, it's an organization and a system that is built around foundational safety regarding law, stability, predictability, consistency for the masses. It's really, I'm going to say it, it's the homemaker of Martha Stewart and the military of Colin Powell, that is where government sits. Organized, planned, detailed, sequence, laws, rules, trust, stability, certainty. That's what government is. Okay. Okay, so far so good? Yes. Now watch how weird this gets. The Republicans have that plus their secondary value is logical, analytical, fact-based. How does the numbers work? That's the old Republicans, not the new Republicans. The old Republicans are there. Right. It's got to be financial. Why are we not balancing the budget? Well, they're not going to balance the budget for things they want, but they are certainly not, they're going to work against the Democrats. Now here's the Democrats. The Democrats are Martha Stewart plus Colin Powell. And then you're adding Oprah Winfrey. They're interested in the people in how do you take care of the collective masses? How do you care for this group of people over here? and make sure everyone's included. So the Republicans, and I'm holding my two hands up for those who are not watching the video, I'm holding, the, the Republicans are saying, we can't spend on those social programs. And the Democrats are going, if you don't spend on these social programs to bring along everyone, include the middle class, you're having a short-term win at a long-term suffering. And welcome to our nation. Wow. Now, watch how weird this one gets. And here it comes. None of them have any new ideas. None of them have any Richard Branson narrative. None of them have any Elon Musk because that scares the safekeeping people. That scares the foundational part of government, scares them. So if a person is 
So who, who, get, who gets the hijack that safekeeping narrative? Trump does with his message of loyalty. I support the military. Well, you know what? He did. He did support the military. He literally overfunded them. All of the military branches said to him, we don't need this much money. We don't, this is an overkill. But did they say that? No, the military no. Uh, contractors go like, we'll spend that money. Thank you very much. And so all of a sudden that message of safekeeping that's funded into the Colin Powell mindset is going like, yeah, you know, we'll figure out how to buy a new, you know, battleship. We're going to, well, it's like, what are we going to do with our old stuff? I don't know. We'll sell it to another country, I guess. So they're, <laughs> they're just, figuring out how to have the used car. It's not a used car sales thing, but it'll be a used weapons thing of, hey, maybe we could get uh, these other co countries to buy our old jets, you know, because <laughs> they might need one of their old jets and we'll sell it to them at a discount because we just got funding from, you know, the American public in order to do that, expanding the military budget. So the, the, the part, the biggest truth part of leadership, Tom, is that, Leadership is going to be defined by these four groups of things. And then they've got to run down these seven narratives. And, and we're going to pick up our next podcast on this. But if I set the foundation for this, then all of a sudden we can say, okay, candidate, this is what Camilla Harris needs to do next. This is what Cory Booker needs to do next. This is what, and they're doing some of it, but this is what, a advanced communication narrative would look like okay so. okay because they have to step out of their comfort zone and these comfortable places whether you know you're the democrats and they're all jockeying for position but what what you were just articulating what they stand for the republicans have what they stand for and then whoever's going to rise to the top has to embody that but also chart out a future vision be step out and be that visionary and and bring that along with what they're comfortable for it seems right that's correct yeah that's wow correct. yeah so so here are the uh, here are the uh, seven primary qualities of communication that i would advocate for you know if um if i want to if i want to start getting ahead a little bit here and uh, Trump will wilt with these things if, you, if the person, if their person brings it or, you know, the Republicans would, you know, kind of really struggle with it. And I know that um, Mitch McConnell is going to have a really, really hard time getting rid of Moscow Mitch right now. He, he's really in big trouble with that, that, uh, that label that, that somebody stuck on him, you know, because. Uh, what was that label? Moscow Mitch. And, and so why did he get that label? Because he is, he is not voting on any protection for oh, elections. That's right. I have. Uh, that's been happening it's recently. Trend, right. It's, tre it's trending. So he's he's going to have a really difficult time getting rid of that because all of a sudden the reason why he's he's blocking that is because all the uh, the, uh, the 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 primary voting machine companies uh, are uh, saying, please don't. You know, don't let them go through because this is going to cut into our bottom line. Yeah, because they're so. saying paper ballots is the ultimate analog way to keep the Russians from hacking into our voting system, right? Yeah, yeah. So if there's any if there's any question in the margin of error, then all of a sudden we've got the paper fallback to go like, wait a minute, you know, this uh, this is what we're going to do recount wise, and this right. is what we're going to do things, and then. They get to do a sampling and they actually can build a system of that. But if you don't go to something that's hard and fast, you can't double check things. Double checking is what government is supposed to do and foster. It's supposed to say, listen, you did this study in medicine and you're going to promote this study and the results. Really? Seriously? Unless there's five uh, follow-up studies that validate this, you cannot market that thing until you get validation studies. But there's no funding for validation studies that just let the marketing fly and let the damage come out. And that regrettably 
forget about the lawsuits and stuff like that. But there, anyways. Okay, so let's uh, let's uh, you know get back to the what truth and the authentic leader is. The authentic leader would do something like this. The authentic leader is going to number one, develop, and and bring small messages of engagement. Small message of engagement. Barack Obama did this, you know, consistently. Hillary Clinton did not do this. Okay, develop a quality of trust. How do you do a develop a quality of trust? You 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 stick to. Here's where I'm going, and let's go ahead and follow this thread. And you know what? We're going to run into wiggly pieces on this. And here's the, here's the thing I would like you to hear about it. It's not flip-flopping if it's honest. Wow. It's not okay. flip-flopping. It's honest. It's not it. I used to think this way. This is what I said in the past. And this is what I'm saying now. I'm not going back to that past thing. I'm doing a thing called self-correcting. That's what an adult does, self-correct. Well, can you imagine if Joe Biden had done some of that regarding the whole segregation thing and busing thing? He, this would have been over. He could have did that in, you know, seven small messages of his engagement and develop, number two, develop a quality of trust. Going like, yeah, I said that back then. Yeah, this is how I meant that. And this is what that means is, and this is where my strength is. I can sit in the room full of somebody spitting nails at me at something that is so abhorrent that I would never agree to that. And I was fighting it all the way from the beginning there. I was one of the leaders that did that when it was the toughest time to do it. Do you see what, uh, wait a minute, did I just become Joe Biden again? <laughs> <You know? laughs> see, it's easy to translate a compelling narrative when you know what frame you're talking from. All right, number three right. in this list is that I've got to advocate for truth that I have been there and done that. Here is where Trump gets his, the great access to power. I have been there and I'm, I have done that. I know how to fire people and I know how to select the best, best person. See how that works? You ready? Right. Now, yeah. now here's, here's what the scary honesty is. Ready, Tom? Yeah. I know how to, on The Apprentice, take 25 mediocre celebrities and pick the best one of those mediocre people. That's the scary honesty, is that he does not know how to pick the per best person. He knows how to fire 19 inferior people that would never make it <laughs> would never make it to the environment now oh so you mean he knows how to pick the lesser of all the 25 evils or 20 evils right that's really right. what it is right that's mm. right so can you imagine whoever the democratic candidate would be oh gosh we need to get this podcast to every candidate right all right all right so again okay, no taking no for take all the campaigns on the, on the democratic right. side yes so the democrat so the democrats could like literally chip into a third of his base right now with like, yeah, one of the best things is he's one of the best sellers everywhere. You know, he said he tried, he sold everybody that he could pick the best people. But what he really did was, is he knows how to fire 19 inferior people on a reality show. Let him see if he can get that jacket to come off him. He, well, because really, they, they can then relate his cabinet over the course of his first four years as a season of The Apprentice firing one by one by one all these different cabinet members and not filling so many positions that are in this sort of acting yeah. phase, right? Yeah, who's, who's going to wanna, who's gonna want to come into government just to come in under that advocacy with that low leadership value set? that he runs with, who's going to do that? Everybody's going to be the acting person because the acting person has a huge grace period because who's going to fire the acting person because guess what they're doing? And this is where I get to press on vocabulary a little bit is that here it comes. I'll lean in a little bit. They're just acting. They're acting as if. Yeah. It's an actor who fires an actor. 
a casting yeah. director fires an actor. You know, it's <laughs> like, uh, and who's Trump? He's a casting director. It's exactly what he is. It's, uh, it's like, who's going to be the one, best one? Oh, yeah, yeah. Put these people on and I get to fire these people. It's like, huh? you know, okay. All right. So inspiration is number four on this list. So inspiration, if we're going to jump into and lean into inspiration, Trump does that pretty well. He does truth that I've been there before, even though it, where he's been isn't really where he's been. He's not at any real making any real decisions. And all the people around him underneath him is, is, are just in there and just, just staying out of the fray of things. So, but he does, he does inspire. He inspires that he has somebody's back. Just like you would inspire, and I'm going to say this, and it's going to get unsettling very quickly, inspire a auditorium full of people that's at his casino. He's going to inspire them to gamble. Sure. And that's what he's done. He's inspired people to gamble on, on him. Right? him. Yeah. That's what he's done. And they're betting their vote, whereas in the past, they would bet their money in the past. So they're betting on a disruptor. I can't, I, I can't, I can't advocate more importantly that they, the votes were betting on a disruptor, not going with the person with the best resume about all the different people that Hillary knew in the environment, she could pick up the phone and call somebody that was working at another government agency that met her 10 years ago that she built a relationship with and get them to do something. Trump, Trump can't call anybody. He can't call anybody downline. And by the way, he doesn't know anybody downline. He doesn't know those government people that are there. He doesn't right. know them. So why? It's it's the fodder. You know, he doesn't know those folks. Okay, so inspiration. If I want to inspire somebody, I'm going to inspire them to be a disruptor. How? What is an adjuster look at? I'm going to do a thing called drain the swamp. That is inspirational. Why? Because this government is not serving the tragic vision of what we think they should do. Well, they're not they uh, he's not talking about the, dis the the problem with the disruption is is the collaborative and cooperative nature of government has been um polarized it's not collaborative or cooperative it's what am, what's going to get me the next donor that's going to give me the money so i can get elected again you know so regrettably there's going to be some term limit stuff that needs to come in be, in order to stop that as well as getting the money out. And, um, and then number five on my list as the leader, as the authentic leader is uh, a call to action and a call to progress. Elizabeth Warren is doing that. Bernie Sanders is doing that. Um, Camilla Harris is getting traction because she's the prosecutor. And some people are going, are saying to themselves, I want her because she is going to process, pr prosecute him for breaking crimes. The other two people, I'm not sure if they're going to prosecute him because that's what tends to happen is I'm not going to prosecute him. But Camilla Harris has got to prosecute because that's in her DNA, just like Trump has got to fire people because he's been practicing that for whatever years of the 12, 20, whatever years he was on the apprentice, 10, 20 years he was on the apprentice. Set the vision. Set the vision is number six. And number seven is stand for values. Set the vision. Trump sets the vision of bring coal back. Well, why is that such a, a strong vision? Because it's a part of our history. History is something people value. And who's the people that vote? The people who like history. Who is that? Martha Stewart and Colin Powell. That's where the primary base is sitting, in those two mindsets. Who's got the best appeal to that? Here it comes. 
Elizabeth Warren. Elizabeth Warren has greater access to Trump's to Trump's to Trump's base than Bernie does, than Biden does, than Camilla Harris does. She has greater access to his debates. Wow, that's illuminating. She yeah, does because every time you say I have a plan and show the advocacy for vision, show the advocacy for small messages. She's going like, those rich people, it's not going to bug them if I tax them over 50 million. How many of you voters has 50 million? None of you do. But is it going to affect you if you elect me? No. Is it going to affect them, the top 0.1%? Yes, definitely. And even the top 5% and even the top 10% are going to take a ding. You could see that on the stage when she went after the guy's $65 million. Hey, you have a $65 million asset. Warren put her hands together and goes, listen, if you're sitting with over 50 million, that 15 million you have above, it's time for you to pay back. It's time for you to help the, the nation out right now because you've been taking money from the middle class long enough and that 15 million that you sit, have above your 65 million, we're not going to touch your 50 million, dude. Be satisfied with that and help us rebuild the nation. Listen, I will take and be glad to name a bridge after you with the 15 million I take to re-bridge that. And by the way, that's her best powerful narrative. Her best narrative is, hey, listen, do you want to do something with your 15 million? I'll tell you what, let's take it and let's build a bridge with it. And I'll put your name on it. They're going to look at her. And as soon as she tells that story, everybody else is going like, you know, I sort of would like a bridge. I don't have to go across and it's dinging me for $5 every time I cross this bridge because some capitalist has got their hand in my pocket. Okay. By the way, that's in real time. There's two bridges in Detroit that one of them you got to pay, the new one, and the old one you don't have to pay, but it's freaking falling down. Mm. Anyways, I'm just uh, ranting on an old fact. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but this is this is – the storytelling, the storytelling, I use, I, uh, for those of you who are just listening to the audio, I'm just rubbing my, uh, my brain right now, is storytelling. You've got to get these value sets to have a story that's associated with it. Something for the listener to go like, oh, that makes sense. Now I see where you're going. That's it. Get out of explanation. Stop explaining things. The biggest complaint I have on on the stage right now is just stop explaining. Give me a picture. Tell me a story. Not the story of your childhood. Don't tell me that story. I'm not tell. Let me pick that up after I stop following. Start following you. Set the vision. Create inspiration. Tell me about the action towards and progress towards that vision. And then give me a small message that's going to work. Start the messages of truth and trust moving in my direction that you may not get there, but heck, I'd rather have a more stable experience getting there rather than the roller coaster of tweet rides that we have to ride on a day-to-day -day basis from a generally agreed upon person that is not bringing stability in the environment, is not helping us with progress, is just complaining about something that is not real, you know, and he's, that's what he's doing because that's what the sizzle is to the steak. Anyways, so I've been ranting a little bit, Tom, what's showing up in your mind here? And as we are setting the stable, uh, the stage for our, uh, for our next, uh, for our next podcast, what 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 are you what are you seeing that's coming forward and and what's kind of landing for you the celebratory things that might be showing up in your noggin? Well, I I think it really helps because right now these debates are all of these aspiring leaders 
And, and and they are some of them are leaders, no question. And they all they yeah. have some of the qualities, right? Yes. Uh, but the but these people who are aspiring to be the leader of our nation, or to yes. certainly their party and then the nation. And I think it's very helpful to look at these different qualities and evaluate them and understand them, uh, understand who they are. And and I think what's interesting is it'll be fun as we go over the journey of this podcast over the next you know year to see to be able to look back and you know because I I, th- I do look forward to doing a little bit of analysis, a little bit of Monday morning quarterbacking of the performance of each of these candidates in the debates and say, well, look, they're showing. They are very strong in this area. They have this quality. They have, they're they're demonstrating these qualities of a leader, but they're missing these other ones. And see if that ends up being an indicator of who eventually outlasts. You know, that's correct. That's correct. Who's going to outlast? And and you know, at this moment, we've got um, uh, Elizabeth Warren sitting in a pretty strong position. Bernie's kind of sitting at spot. Buttigieg is sitting there. Camilla Harris is kind of like the top four, uh, you know, even though Joe Biden has the votes that he does, he's not having the level of uh, strength of narrative. He's got the name recognition. Um, uh, he has had the, he's got the name recognition, but re- um, um, so, so the challenge with uh, the name recognition is now he's got to back that up with stronger framing. Um, right. If I was on his campaign, if, you know, I mean, uh, I would I would start framing the issues in, in a way that's going to stick because right now his framing is not great. Um, he's uh, he's being reactive and responsive and 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 he's he's gotten that way. I mean he's been he's a great interpersonal leader. I mean he's uh, he's got the humility. He's got the the ability to be uh, kind and and supportive to people and 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 really. Um, you know, being an advocate, a social advocate, as he's been over the years, it's just like crazy the amount of service that he's done. I mean, there's how, how do you sac- how do you not like a person that sacrificed that his family members have sacrificed their lives for the nation? How do you yeah. not like that guy? I know. And I mean, you know, how do you say, well, you know, I sacrificed one of my kids, you know, uh, you know. Uh, my kid, uh, you know, followed me and then went into war and died from it. It's like, geez, you know, how do you do that? Right. And, and so it's touching and moving. And the framing that uh, that he needs to do around is history. And uh, the framing he needs to do around his visionary leadership is, um, is really significant um, that I think um, it could be a lot stronger and written a lot stronger in his speeches and his – and what uh, what he's going to be delivering to people, he is a nice guy. He doesn't have to lean on that so much, and he and uh, but being responsive rather than setting the inspirational tone is very very different, very very different. It's it's different. There's there's only so many moments of interface that human beings have on this planet, and um, and those moments of interface um, are going to go the ones that can set the vision. You know, give small messages, engender trust, um, advocate for truth, and then uh, you know create the uh, calls to action, and 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 then uh, engage the the values. Um, even if they can't get it, if it's real or imagined, at least they're they're fighting for what mutual respect looks like. And and you know what? If if you start talking mutual respect, people are going to start vibrating towards mutual respect. They'll start doing it. Uh, but if you go after name calling, people are going to start, you know, vibrating around name calling. They just will. And yeah. you know, who wants to be in that middle school fight? You know, it's like God. You know, you know. Anyways. <laughs> wow. Very gr- Very cool. Thank you, Bill. That that was really fun and really helpful. I think it's it's great to not just talk about each of these candidates and how they're succeeding or how they're falling short, but framing it in a, in a, with a common language we can understand uh, and, and a a set of qualities that, that makes sense to judge them against uh, I think is very helpful for me. So thank you for that. Well, you're welcome. I just uh, such a great joy to kind of do this and any way that we can move the needle, Tom, is really significant. I think that I think uh, more adult voices, um, 
uh, more scary honesty about what we're facing here. And also, you know, for the people that, you know, voted for Trump, we really want to bring them uh, messages that they can rehook into the collective or the greater message. It's not going to affect everybody. You know, some people are going to stay with their limiting beliefs or stay with uh, the things that inspired them. You know, and there are still people that follow tragic leaders and they still, uh, you know, whether it's a different country or whatever, they, they, you know, you can get hooked up and, and a tragic leader can, can you know, create the, uh, the illusion of these seven things. But you know what? We need adults to start speaking in an adult way, you know, and that's, um, uh, that's the, the, the ability to be advocacy, uh, be an advocate, as well as knowing there's only certain things we can get done in the field of time. Yeah, so anyways. All right. All right. More to come, Tom. This has been great. I really appreciate uh, us doing this. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you. Me too. All right. See you next time. Okay. Thanks. Thank you for listening to this Purchasing Truth podcast. We trust that you have enjoyed this engaging and thought-provoking conversation. Our hope is that you've received value, found clarity, and broadened your truth perspective in this episode. If you did, leave us a review or visit our website, purchasingtruth.com. Join us again for another informative and content-rich discussion here at the Purchasing Truth Podcast. Don't just accept whatever information comes your way. Join the discussion. Discover your own voice. Purchase your own truth.